Welcome hockey parents to the All Our Mental Game Secrets Revealed webinar. Topic today is how to help your teenage hockey player reach their goals. We've got a record crowd on the call tonight. It's great to see a growing number of parents thinking outside the box and exploring the endless potential of the mental side of hockey. So I wanted to thank you all for joining me today. I'm confident that if you stick with me to the end here, you're going to walk away with some great ideas that will help your teenager immensely. In terms of agenda, we're going to talk about, we're going to start out with what gets in the way of a teenager's success. Then we're going to move to, we're going to have a little conversation about solutions that can identify the hidden roadblocks that are holding your teenager back. Then we're going to have some fun. We're going to analyze the mental game profiles of some first round NHL draft picks, as well as some highly touted failures. We're going to explore a Mental Game Academy case study with a college player I recently worked with. And then we're going to wrap things up with a little bit of Q&A. So we're all here today because we have a teenage hockey player in the family who we want to help succeed, to be the best player they can be. I'm sure we can all agree that strong physical skills are an important part of your teenager's success. But the folks on this webinar have a little bit of an advantage. We're here today, together today because we understand the importance of the mental game as well. We're all aware of the often unseen opportunity that lies below the surface for any hockey player. Now, while it's obvious for most parents where to go to get help with physical skill development, it's not always so obvious how to best train the mental game. So that's where I come in. My name's Andrew Party. I'm a coach. I'm a former college athlete. And I work with hundreds of hockey players to help them develop and refine an NHL style mental game. I have an advanced certification in the field of psychometrics. And what I'm about to show you is guaranteed to improve your teenager's mental game. Guaranteed to make them a more confident, consistent performer and even help them manage the day to day stresses of life as a teenage athlete. So I'm excited to share this information with you. So let's get right into it. Perhaps the most important insight I want to share in this webinar is that what's in the way is different for every teenager. Every player is unique. It's important for parents to understand that to have a meaningful and lasting impact on your teenager's mental game, you have to use a bottom-up approach that's tailored to the unique needs of your teenager. There's no such thing as one size fits all when it comes to the mental game. That approach is just too general to work. So let's shift gears and talk about the top 10 telltale signs of a weak mental game. So parents, if you see any of these warning lights, your teenager may need some help. So the first sign is inconsistent, inconsistency, inconsistent performance. So consistent play is probably the single biggest difference maker between players and becomes more and more important the older you get. Um, Consistent players get more ice time, more opportunity. Inconsistent players typically are not trusted by coaches and, and find themselves sliding down the lineup. So consistency is definitely an important idea. Um, second sign is poor confidence. It's really hard for a player to develop and improve if they don't believe that they can. Third sign is not having fun. So my philosophy is hockey has to be fun. Full stop. No fun means short career. The fourth thing I see out there a lot is a fear of mistakes. Many players stuck in their heads, worried about making mistakes, um, and it shows up in their game really as hesitation, second guessing, inconsistency, lack of confidence. Very common out there that I see players who are really fearful of making mistakes which is pretty ironic because the mistakes are the things that make a player better. They're the, they're critical to, to, to make. Um, so if you're afraid to make a mistake, it's kind of like being afraid to get better. Then number five on the list here is an inability to find the zone or find that flow state. So performance is all about getting in the zone, all about getting in that optimal state of performance because that's where all the magic happens. So just to continue on, uh, number six on the list, a lot of times I'll see players who practice at a high level. So all their skill 
is revealed in practice, but then you drop them in a kind of a more pressure packed game type situation and everything changes. Um, that hesitation, um, lack of confidence, all those things start to show up when there's a little bit more pressure on. Another telltale sign is an inability to bounce back from mistakes. So resiliency here is really what we're talking about. Um, many players get emotionally overwhelmed, get lost in their minds and really can't recover when things go wrong. And recovery times have to be short in a game like hockey. Number eight on the list, nervousness, anxiety before games and in big moments. Again, a racing mind creates a shaky foundation um, in those big moments. A lot of players, again, get stuck in their heads and it really makes it difficult for them to focus. They're battling themselves. You know, the, the research says the average person thinks between 50 and 70,000 thoughts a day, 80% of which is negative. And if you don't have a plan to deal with that, then it's definitely going to cause problems on the ice. And then number 10 kind of ties into that excessive self-criticality, negativity, um, hurts performance and can actually be more of a serious long-term issue. So those are the telltale signs. Um, and parent, parents typically come to me because they see those flashes of brilliance from their teenager, those moments that tell you that they have the physical ability to dominate, but then they also see their teenager struggling with some, you know, something from the list, the top 10 list, or maybe multiple things from the top 10 list that really prevent them from bringing it all together. Well, most parents will also see the same things that are holding their teenager back on the ice, showing that, uh, seeing that show up off the ice as well. So it's a little bit of a mystery that a lot of parents are, are trying to solve. So let's switch gears here and talk about solutions. So solutions to the myriad of things that can stand in the way of your teenager's success. It's a little bit different for everybody. But what I found to be an extremely efficient way of getting to the bottom of your teenager's unique set of performance challenges is something called hockey psychometrics, which is the field of study concerned with the theory and technique of measuring an athlete's preferences, abilities, attitudes, and traits. So to simplify, it's the use of scientific questionnaires that measure a player's mental game and compares them to NHL players. So really what it does is it allows us to measure the 20 measurable aspects of performance in hockey. So bringing those intangibles into the world of tangible um, and then using that data to maximize development and performance. Another important um, topic in the world of performance, the world of hockey, is self-awareness. So research tells us that increasing self-awareness is the single best thing that we can do to help our teenagers be successful. And so much so that I actually named my company the Self-Aware Athlete. And the best way to teach self-awareness is through psychometrics. So to sort of bring all those intangibles out into the, the world of, of tangible so that they can be measured and identified and, and worked on. So two main ideas here, um, really, I think the way to summarize this would be the best thing you can do for your teenager is to increase their level of self-awareness so that they understand themselves, they understand what happens to them when they get under pressure, and then they've got the ability to um, do something different on the ice instead of getting lost in their heads, instead of um, you know, dumping into all that negative thought and negative emotion and, and getting out of control. We want to get them more self-aware. We use psychometrics to do that, to get them more in control of themselves. So, like I said, the single best thing you can do for your teenager is increase their level of self-awareness. So, let's shift gears here. And let's look at the mental game or psychometric profiles of some first round NHL draft picks through a psychometric lens. So what we're looking at here, I know this is a, this is a small slide and I'm just going to use it to kind of talk high level. Um, but this is the, really the mental game profile of a 2019, um, top 20 NHL pick. 
So the assessment was conducted in 2017. This player went on to, to get drafted in the first round of, um, of the NHL draft. So really, I just want to cover high level what this, you know, just what you're looking at here. So this is a one page um, psychometric profile, really a summary of a player's mental game. And if you could see my mouse moving around here on the uh, on the report, you can see basically up at the top of the profile the, the name of the player, which I've abbreviated here, um, the date they completed the assessment, and then the normative group, which is in this case NHL players. And then the report is divided up into four pieces. So the first piece talks about attentional characteristics. There are really six things that we measure that have to do with attentional characteristics. Um, the second part is about behavior control, two variables that we measure that relate to an athlete's behavior control. The third part of the puzzle is about interpersonal style. So really, I think it's 12 pieces of the puzzle that relate to inter interpersonal style. And then there's a fourth section here called profile patterns, which we're, we're not going to talk about um, uh, for the purposes of this discussion. But then below on this report, what we really have is a, a graphical representation of what we see above. So uh, across the, the x-axis are the 20 different pieces of the mental game that we've measured. And then the percentile scores up the side. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to click to the next slide here. And really what this is, is a blow up of the chart that you see um, below. So just to dig in a little bit in terms of what you're looking at, um, again, across the bottom, the 20 different parts of the mental game that we've measured. Up the y-axis are the percentile scores. So the way this works, if we took the first scale or the first piece of the mental game that we've measured, um, so the short name is BET. If you go up from there, if you look at the gray bar, so that's where the norm group will typically score in this range of scores. So NHL players will score somewhere in this gray bar. And then where the black line hits the gray bar, that's where the athlete who's completed the assessment scores on that particular idea. So that's really how we're going to do the, the NHL comparison. But high level, what we're looking at here, this first section on the left is really all about attention. Um, this little section in the middle here, this is the behavior control piece. And then we've got the interpersonal style portion on the, on the right here. So really high level, I mean, typically I'll sit down and have an hour conversation with an athlete about this, about this chart. So I'm going to go really high level here and just give you a good feel for, for what I see with this first round draft pick and maybe highlight some of the, some of the things that, um, that continue to propel this athlete forward. So from an attentional perspective, what we've got here is an athlete who is capable of tremendous focus. So they can really get their attention narrowed down and that allows them to do things like you kind of out train. They, they can focus to the point where they leave everybody in the dust in terms of their ability to, to tolerate redundancy, just to repeat, repeat, repeat. Um, you know, really the key to developing skill is the ability to, to repeat and, um, you know, in a training context. Um, this scale right here is indicating an athlete who has got a high level of hockey IQ. I'll summarize it that way. And then this part of the puzzle here is about vision. Just being able to, to see all of the moving parts on, out on the ice. Um, in, in my program, I call it awareness. Um, a lot of times in the hockey world, it's referred to as, as vision. So again, the portion on the right, all having to do with attention. Now, as strong as this athlete is from an attentional perspective, sort of high scores on all of the aspects of attention, um, there are some opportunities for this athlete and they have to do with distraction. So really this scale here and the one next to it really are indicating an athlete that can easily be distracted by things going on around them and then relatively easily distracted by their own thoughts and emotions is really what um, this score right here is telling me. And then this score right here can be thought of as resiliency. So how quickly does an athlete recover from mistakes and kind of get back into the flow of the game, get back into the zone, that optimal state of performance? And what we saw with this athlete in 2017 was some real opportunity around um, understanding what distracts them and loading in tools and, and self-awareness that helps this athlete greatly manage their distractions and, and, um, and really get into the flow of the game, get into the zone. 
So um, some, some opportunities that showed up early on here. This is a measure of the scale of the neighbor here is about information processing. So how the athlete prefers to deal with information. So we're seeing an athlete that had a high level of information processing capability. And then the next scale is telling me that we've got a creative athlete, somebody here who has the ability to put together a play that, you know, probably most uh, players can't. So just a, a real kind of risk taking sort of a, a tendency with this athlete. That has definitely served them well. Uh, we've got an athlete who likes to be in control of people and situations, a highly confident athlete, a highly competitive athlete, uh, an athlete who has a certain amount of obsessiveness in their profile. Um, and again, with this athlete, one of the keys to success, just able to get focused and obsess about developing skill. Uh, we've got an athlete here who, um, just from a, a orientation to other people perspective, a little bit of an introvert, um, somebody who, you know, wasn't necessarily a rah-rah type of player in the dressing room, more kind of self-contained and a little bit quiet. But in terms of communication uh, style, which is what the next three scales kind of measure, we had an athlete who was all about the why, you know, very sort of um, oriented around wanting to know the reasons why certain things had to had to happen. And then the last three pieces of the puzzle here, we have a, a coachable athlete, uh, a dedicated athlete, and an athlete who really liked to be in the spotlight, didn't have a fear of making mistakes, just was out there creating and, uh, and enjoying the game. So that's really high level, uh, um, this first, uh, first profile. Again, now uh, an athlete who is in the, the Dallas Stars organization. So moving on, we can look at a, a second uh, top 20 pick from the 2019 draft. This player is a center. Um, and again, just a really high level across this program or across this profile. We're seeing off the charts focus. So maybe this athlete could get overly focused and maybe stuck sometimes, um, but had that tolerance for redundancy, which is a, a key piece of success. The hockey IQ is here. Uh, the vision's here. And then with this athlete, definitely some uh, tendency to get distracted by things going on in their environment, but much more resilient, much less likely to get tied up with that 50 to 70,000 negative thoughts that go through the average athlete's mind. High information processing, very creative, um, you know, again, high control needs, very self-confident, little bit less competitive than you, you you might think you would see from uh, from a first round NHL draft pick but certainly in the norm group and um, uh, yeah kind of enough to get the job done again we've got this obsessiveness tendency here which is another uh, important piece of the puzzle with this athlete um, this athlete much more extroverted much more uh, a center of attention type of person in the in the dressing room but then also, you know, an athlete here who wanted to get away and needed his alone time as well. In terms of communication, you'd see a, a ver and another athlete who really wanted to understand why, needed to understand things, came at things from sort of an intellectual perspective. And then an athlete who was very supportive of, um, you know, of their teammates. Again, a high coachability factor here, off the charts, dedication, and then a comfort level in the spotlight, which is what this last uh, this last variable is telling us here. So one of the things that is built into this assessment is something called um, this, this, the assessment focuses a lot of, about on attention, and really allows me to teach an athlete about something called attentional style. Now, probably too big of a topic to get into in a, a great amount of detail here, but. In essence, when you think about it, the only thing that a hockey player has control over during a game or during, you know, one of those pressure packs or the game type situations is their attention. It's the only thing they have control over. They don't control their line mates. They don't control their teammates. They don't control their coaches. The only thing they really control is how they pay attention. And when an athlete learns to get in control of their attention, and, and trust me when I say almost no athletes on top of this right now, so it really is a valuable 
peace to lay in. But when they learn to quiet their mind and get in control of their own thoughts, get in control of their own emotions, understand how their attention works, what you find is distractions are eliminated. Resiliency really increases. Recovery times are enhanced because the mind becomes quiet and allows an athlete to get in that flow state, get in that optimal state of performance. So let's shift gears a little bit here and let's talk about, um, we're going to go through a couple of examples here of highly touted players who made it to the major junior level, but really did not meet um, uh, their high expectations, I guess. So I think when you see these profiles, you'll start to get a feel. They look a little bit different from the, from the ones that we just talked about. So this is the profile of um, a, a player that was it came to the, the Canadian Hockey League, more specifically the Ontario Hockey League, via the import draft. So this was a, a player from the U.S. who um, was really recruited by a major junior team. And if you just eyeball this profile, you can start to see it looks a little bit different. And if we, we start to talk a little bit about the attentional side of things, you can see the attentional scores are, are, well, they're much lower, but the thing that really jumps off the page to me is this is the athlete's resiliency score. So a really um, just a lack of resiliency here when, you know, when this player made a mistake, everything kind of went sideways and went sideways in a hurry. They just had a hard time recovering. They would dump into their head, which is really what the scale here is telling me, hang out in their head and beat themselves up for a while and just get themselves overwhelmed emotionally to the point where they, they really just could not recover. So just uh, as gifted as this player was physically, um, just emotionally, they were not in control and, and really unable to recover when things went wrong. And we've got a, you know, an indication here of just a uh, slower information processing capabilities. And although their creativity piece was there, um, this athlete just spent a lot of time in their head emotionally overwhelmed and, and couldn't really take advantage of, of um, you know, this strong, of this strength. So although we had an athlete who wanted to be in control, look at where their confidence ended up, just a, a really low confidence score. Um, the compete level was was okay, but really we had a lot of obsessiveness in the profile. So just an athlete that really obsessed over mistakes and just ended up kind of wiped out emotionally. And we look at this profile, what we see is, is there's a lot of expression of frustration and anger here in the profile. Um, this scale right here is, is really indicative of a very, very negative and self-critical athlete, which definitely worked against, against them. Um, the dedication factor wasn't really there, which is part of the reason we weren't seeing strong results. And then, as you can imagine, we had an athlete here who just spent a lot of time in their head worried about making mistakes, which in the end was their, was their downfall. So that, this really is a picture of, you know, something that just a, a corner that an athlete can get backed into when they don't have mental skills to, to allow them to stay calm, cool and collected under pressure. This is really what can happen. And believe me, it wasn't fun to watch and wasn't fun for this athlete to be in this place. Um, would have been much more constructive if we had been able to get to this athlete and, and do some mental skills training because I think this could have been turned around, but unfortunately we didn't have that opportunity. So second profile of, of you know, where things can go wrong. Um, this was actually a, a top five pick in, in an OHL draft. Um, a, a player who was really highly touted, expected to be a, a first round NHL draft pick, but ended up being a, a fifth round pick. And is now sort of, um, you know, in the ECHL still, you know, still trying to figure things out. And if we look at this profile, attentionally, things actually look pretty good. We've got a, a strong ability to focus, um, maybe an indication here of not as much IQ as we'd like to see, but a, you know, great vision on the ice, able to see the game. And the first kind of chink in the armor that we're seeing here is a slow recovery speed, this res lacking resiliency here. So, a player that tended to get emotionally caught and stuck. We're seeing relatively low information processing speeds, and here's where things get interesting with the profile. Just a player who was very, very um, 
uh, just a, a lack of creativity here. So a player who really had one trick up their sleeve and it worked great for them in, in youth hockey, but as they worked up the ranks, it, it uh, um, you know, the lack of creativity really started to hurt. Um, so control score was kind of neither here nor there. We, the athletes still very confident. They had a, an amazing youth hockey career and very competitive athlete. Um, you know, we had an athlete who was a good communicator in the dressing room. Um, but what we saw here, I think maybe that if we move along to this scale here, the kiss of death was a just a rock bottom score on um, coachability. So this was an athlete who just would not listen, didn't matter what you told them. They, you know, they'd grown up with a lot of success, had all the answers through youth hockey, got into major junior and just was not able to, to learn, was not able to take uh, any, any coaching on board and, and really they got stuck because of that. Um, so yeah, so that, that's kind of another, uh, another, uh, profile that, you know, really resulted in some disappointment. So let's shift gears here and let's move to the, the case study portion of the presentation today. So um, we're just going to look at the a, a before and after scenario of a player that I worked with. Um, in they, they were in the, the null, so a tier two junior league um, or junior A league in the U.S. just for the Canadians on the call. So this player's name is Jackson Willie. At the time uh, I started to work with him, was with the, the Mexico Ice Wolves. So if we take a real high level look at this profile, if we look on the attentional side, I think we can all start to see some, some issues, uh, high levels of distractibility. So this was an athlete who really what I would say is easily got stuck in their heads, easily got tied up and distracted by a ton of negative thinking in their own mind and had a tendency to sort of spiral out of control and, and really get overwhelmed emotionally. And, and, you know, they were unable to recover, which is really what we're seeing here with this scale. And I would say that is a common theme with athletes all across North America. There's a real tendency because of heightened levels of anxiety out there in the world these days for high expectations um, for athletes to really get bogged down in their own minds and, and, and spiral into this emotional overwhelm, which was really what was happening with, with Jackson. Um, with Jackson, we had, you know, it's good information processing speeds, uh, a very creative player. We had a confident, competitive player here, but this scale here is really read on obsessiveness. So what we had in Jackson was really a, um, a perfectionist. So somebody who really wanted things to go a certain way, really competitive, really, really wanted it. But then when things didn't go the way he wanted, he just got lost in his own mind, kind of panicked. Um, so if we move across again, we can see a lot of, um, you know, a lot of frustration and anger over this dynamic, a lot of self-criticality. But again, we had a player who was extremely dedicated, was willing to go through a wall to have success. But at the end of the day, just emotionally, they were in their head fearing mistakes, um, just obsessing about not making mistakes. And, and really, Jackson was, was lost in his own mind here. And, and, you know, at the time that I met him, the time he completed this profile was in a pretty, in a pretty good funk. So I brought Jackson through my six week, um, online mental game academy training program. And just really taught him about himself through the lens of this assessment, got him up to speed on himself and what was really happening. Um, and um, yeah, at the end of the program, so here's how things looked. This was really the changes that we were able to accomplish over a short period of time. So you could see that all of the distractibility was really brought under control. Um, the attentional scores on, on vision and, and hockey IQ went up. Um, you know, one of the big striking things about this profile was the tendency to get emotionally overwhelmed or rec recovery speeds went up dramatically. Um, and what we ended up with was a player who got focused on the right things instead of the wrong things. Now, still a work in progress in terms of recovery speed, but a, a great turnaround for Jackson. Um, 
you know, I don't think there were a lot of great moves here, but, you know, so we had the, we had the confidence. We still had the control. We had a competitive athlete here. The obsessiveness came into line with norm group, so that helped quite a bit. Um, the frustration and anger, you know, came into check. The self-criticality was a big win, so we went from an athlete who was really, really hard on himself to somebody who was actually looked a lot more like a like an NHL player in terms of self-criticality. Um, so self-criticality, it's an important piece of the puzzle. As an athlete, you do need to be self-critical, but it's important to keep that in balance. And then we had that dedication and drive that was still there. And a lot more comfort just being in the spotlight and, and comfort making those mistakes. So a big win here for Jackson. And Jackson actually went on to start fielding some uh, offers from NCAA schools and, and is now actually playing living out his dream as an NCAA hockey player. So I think it's fair to say that Jackson probably would have struggled to get to that NCAA level had he not gone through the Mental Game Academy. I think it, it really turned the tide for him. And here's just a, a testimonial that, that Jackson shared um, about his experience with the program. So um, I'll just read it here. You know, when I started working with Coach Andrew last season, I was gripping my stick way too tight, overthinking and afraid to make mistakes. Andrew got me out of my head, in the zone, and playing my best game consistently. This year I'm wearing the A for my team and just signed a college commitment. So that was a big win for Jackson and fun to be a part of. So let's talk a little bit about, a little bit more about the Mental Game Academy program. It's a six-week online mental skills training program. It includes um, some, there's a, a video portal involved in the program. There is some one-on-one -on -one training that goes on in the program around the, the psychomet use of psychometrics, the assessment we've been talking about, and, and its use to increase self-awareness. Um, it really does, what it does is it empowers your teenager to be the best athlete they can be. So high level, that's a little bit about the, the academy. Who's it perfect for? It's perfect for parents who have kids playing an elite level of hockey and they're looking for that competitive advantage. So when you gain emotional control, attentional control, really what will happen is you'll start to see a more confident, consistent version of your, of your teenager, less emotional, less caught in their head, less tentative. Um, you really see, uh, start to see the, the, you know, that best player show up more frequently, more consistently. It's perfect for players who have high potential, but they're under, underachieving because of the, you know, really because they're not in control of their own mind, not in control of their own attention. It's great for parents who want to empower their teenager to be the best they can be. And for, for parents who want to use hockey as a platform to teach critical life skills. And to me, that's really what it's all about. The skills that I teach in the program, while they're great for performance, they're great to get an athlete up to that next level. These are also tools and skills that an athlete can use to, um, you know, to improve life off the ice and, and school, I guess, is the most um, obvious place for that. So if you're interested in learning more about the Mental Game Academy, um, a couple of ways you can go about this. This is a link to my calendar. Um, basically, you can use this link to, to go into my calendar and, and, and book a time. Um, you can book a, a free 30-minute strategy session where really we can have a conversation about your situation, have a conversation about your teenager. We can talk about some ideas to help them improve their performance right now. And we can assess whether or not you know, the, the academy is a fit for you and your family. Um, uh, here's my phone number. If you want to give me a call and chat about it, I'm open to that. My email address. And then here's a link to my website, which has got a, a bunch of testimonials on there from NHL, NHL coaches and general managers and, and tier one junior GMs and coaches and a lot of athletes, a lot of parents. So, you know, if you want to see some, some success from the program, that certainly would be a, a great place to go. And thanks for, for attending the webinar today. Um, what I'm going to do, if you have some questions, I just ask you to hold the questions for um, your scheduled free 30-minute strategy session call. So thanks again for attending, and I hope to speak with you all soon.